fall, theologically, is a very interesting teacher. You really have to pay attention to Paul. He gets, he, he goes technical on you. What's amazing to me is how technical he can become sometimes in the Greek language and still come across very simply. Um, he's done that in verses 12 through 14 and then 15 through 21. I broke that up because he's, he takes you into two different directions. And he does it really interestingly. So here's what he says in verses 12, 13, and 14. Therefore, meaning what he has talked about since he opened chapter 5, justification by faith, Martin Luther's great discourse on that subject, justification by faith, uh, it was dynamic for Paul. Justification by faith turned, turned Paul into what God turned Luther into in the Reformation. He did it within the Jewish structure. Justification by faith so impact Paul's life that he became an enemy within his own religious group the Jew. And he was impacted by that doctrine. One day we'll come back and we'll deal more intensely about it. But I'm looking to where he took us, but with the word therefore, talking about justification by faith through the first 11 verses, his argument. And then he comes to the word therefore. He says, therefore, just as through one man, we know that to be Adam in verse 14, as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread. That's really interesting terminology. It is the word enter and spread where you get the imputation of Adam's sin, the theology, the theology. And that's why justification by faith is so necessary in the human race. The word Entered and spread is tied together in the concept of the imputation of Adam's sin, AOS. Therefore, just as through one man Adam's sin entered, to the, entered into the world, <clears throat> now watch what he says, and death through that sin, and death through the sin, and so death from the sin spread to all mankind because all have sinned in it. All, are, all have sinned in it. All, all are sinners because of it. <clears throat> Not a sinner because you sin. You're a sinner because you're an Adam. You sin as a result of it. <clears throat> then he says, for until the law, capital L, talking about Mosaic, he'll explain it in a moment. Until the law, the sin... I'm talking about, he says, was in the world. The sin of Adam, the inner and the spread to mankind, until the law, Mosaic time, we're talking about 1440, you know, when he leads the exodus, the great exodus, out of Egypt, and they come out established as a nation, and then Moses is going to be given the law. For until the law, until puts us in a time frame. The word until is a time frame. It's, un, it's a time frame. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So how did sin get in the world before the Mosaic law? Now, I'm going to give you the answer because I don't want you to guess. Because of violation of the Enoch law, the law that was in the Garden of Eden that was violated, trespassed, trespassed and transgressed. <clears throat> that would be Genesis 2.17. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
For in the day, for in the day, for in the day you eat of it, dying you will die. In the day. And that's what Paul is talking about. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses. What death is he talking about? He's talking about spiritual death, but what death specifically? The one that came through Adam, right? The one who came through Adam. Romans 12, 5, 12. It was that very deed that required God to send his son to go to the cross to be buried and raised from the dead so that man could be justified the justice of God so that man could be justified by faith in that. <clears throat> Nevertheless, de death did what? It rained. Now, that's not R-A-I-N-D, okay? <clears throat> this is the master over something. Death reigned, dominated. Death reigned from Adam until Moses, the law, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam. In other words, they didn't commit a personal sin that got them into Adam. It was Adam's sin that got them in this, the spiritual state they're in. Do you understand that? Well, just read it and tell you do, because I can't explain it better than he did. See, you just have to work it until you understand it. Now watch. The first Adam, the offense over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, Adam who, Adam who, the Adam who sinned, the Adam who is a type of him, capital H, Christ, who was to come. You know, the first human being, or plural beings, the first members of the human race that knew that it was going to require Christ to come into the world to, to meet their justification by faith, you know who that was? Adam and Eve. He just told you that. He just told you that. Well, see the word Adam in verse 14? Adam who... Adam who, Adam who is a type of him who was to come. We have the first Adam, we have the last Adam. Now, he's going to switch the subject. He's going to stay on cue, but he's going to change it 15 through 21. I just need to get you from 12 to 14 today. <laughs> then I'll take you from 15 to 21. All right? All right. So here we are. Because I've already had my prayer <clears throat> on your lesson. I'm often asked, either by letter or by person, how could Adam's sin be passed on to all members of the human race? Now, their question often indicates they, a sense of feeling unjust. And if you're in a conversation with them, that usually comes out by letter. You don't always see it. But I feel like it's there because when I talk to people face to face, it always comes out. That seems pretty unfair. <clears throat> okay? Seems pretty un un uh, unfair. In Christian theology... What Adam did in theology, we call it the imputation of Adam's original sin. When this question is often asked, it has a sense of people feeling that that's really unfair. If, for any chance, you think this is unfair, then think about this proposition with me. God nailed his only begotten son to a cross. 
and then passed on to him all of Adam's original sin that had been passed on to the whole human race from the beginning of time to the end of time where we're not there yet, as well as all personal sin. Because there's a difference between Adam's sin and personal sin. So when people say to me, I think that's pretty unfair, I say to them, I do understand that. But when you look at what God, what measure God took, then the unfairness you're talking about pales in comparison, in my opinion. Because it was God himself who nailed his only begotten son to a cross prophetically, like Isaiah 53, 3 and 4. Pierced and crushed for our sins. Pierced and crushed for our sins. And not only for our sins only, but those of the whole world, 1 John 2, 2. He didn't die just for your sins. He died that death for all sin of the human race. And not the sin they commit. It's the sin they didn't commit. It's the sin of being part of the members of the human race. You're a, you're a hu member of the human race because of Adam and Eve. The word Adam deals with how man was created. And the word Eve talks about where human life comes from. That's their names, Adam and Eve. You know who gave Eve her name? Adam. You know who gave Adam his name? God. You know what he's called before God said, we're not going to call him that any longer? He was called ground. Is what the word Adam means. Well, anyhow, just let you know. First John 2.2, 2, as I mentioned, he didn't die just for our sins. He died for the sins of the whole world. That takes it all the way to the end of the world. I mean, you talk about six hours on a cross to take care of all the sins of human history. We don't know how long human history is going to go, but listen, it doesn't matter how long it goes. The work of Christ on the cross takes care of the sin that separates man from God. Adam's sin separates man. The, what separates an unbeliever from God is Adam's sin. Didn't write it, they just read it. Right? Didn't write it. 1 John 3, 5 talks about the impeccability. You know that he appeared, talking about Christ, he appeared in order to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. The justice of God worked twice. Once it worked for Jesus Christ, and the second time it works for you. It worked for him when he said it is finished and the father went justified. Think about that. In verses 12 through 14, Paul used a specific Greek word for the offense of Adam, the trespass, the offense of Adam. Here it is in verse 12 where, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. Verse 14, over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense, parabasis, there is the word that's used there. It's not the word that he's going to use in 15 through 21. He's going to use a different Greek word to talk about the same event in different light. And that's really important to some of us 
He used the word parabasis. And then I gave you the other Greek word that we'll talk about next time. In Romans 5, 12 through 14, Paul used parabasis, the word offense in the English. He used it to explain the offense. Now watch this. It's really important for this Greek word. The offense of breaking the stipulation of the legal penal agreement contained in the Enoch law. I got a little technical with you because Paul did. Parabasis. You see, I wrote it on your paper. I know you could. There's no way you'd ever get that. And you may have to really think about it to understand it. The offense of breaking the stipulation of the legal penal agreement contained in the Enoch law. Here it is in the second Genesis 2.17, and I want you to write something on your paper in a moment. From the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die, or dying you will die in Hebrew. Dying, it's muth muth. It's a word dying used twice, from a cal imperfect to a cal infinitive, or from a cal infinitive to a cal imperfect. And it means absolutely. That the English use the word surely. You will surely, you will absolutely die a double death. You will die a spiritual death, and you'll die a physical death because of Adam's sin. Now, we don't have a problem with the fact of saying the human race dies at some point in their life. They're going to die. They even estimate when that'll be. <laughs> I hope you don't believe all that foolishness. Well, you know, you're, if you're a male, you're only going to live to 78. And if you're a female, you'll outlive them a couple years, so make sure they got a good will. You got to pay attention to what the Bible says. Just quit listening to all that foolishness. You're born, to, you didn't have any control over your birth. You don't have any over your death. Enjoy your life for Christ. Enjoy your life. Well, you know, when you turn 60, oh boy, when you turn 70, when you turn 80, when you turn 90, ah, quit all that foolishness. Isn't it funny that all of a sudden age is exciting? I was 10 and now I'm 15 and now I'm 20 and now I'm 25 and now I'm 30 and now I'm 35. All of a sudden you get to 60 and you go like, well, I'm there. That's the craziest stuff. It's not biblical. Why do you buy into that foolishness? It's like global warming. You know what global warming is? Weather. But you can't sell weather. You know what I mean? You can't call it weather. I mean, it, it global warming and some kind of craziness. It's weather. Golly. And listen, everybody knows who controls weather. Sure not Congress, thank God. It's weather. I don't care what they call it. They just call it all that foolishness. This kind of gets you sidetracked from what really is. When you say to a young person, you know you're talking about weather. They go like, what? Man, if I was paying all that money to send them to college, I'd ask them some of these questions. Too expensive for them to be stupid when they come out. Gee whiz. Well, anyhow, I feel better. Thank you. Every, every once in a while, I have to vent, so thank you. Now, here's what I said. Paul used the word parabasis. It means an offense. But what it means is a breaking of a stipulation of a legal agreement. In this case, it's penal. A legal agreement. Breaking a stipulation of a, of a, of a legal agreement. In this case, it carries the death penalty, so it's penal. Do you understand that? Okay. What was it? Look, I said, what stipulation did Adam break? 
What was the stipulation? Do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? And that's what he said. In the day. That's why Paul used this technical legal term, parabasis. That's what it means. And he's smart. We're all smart if we let the Holy Spirit teach us. Nevertheless, it's written in verse 14, nevertheless, spiritual death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned in the likeness, that legal jargon. You know what I'm saying? The offense, the legal jargon. None of us ate from the tree of the <laughs> God you. None of us were under that law. How did I get it? See, that's what Paul, Paul has had that argument, and Paul is answering that argument, isn't he? Then how did I get it? You are a human being. Your little dog don't have it. Your little cat don't have it. But your little son does. <laughs> your little daughter does. Because they're a human being. Say, that's the story of Genesis, isn't it? That's the story of creation. Nevertheless, spiritual death reigned. Now, here's what's interesting. You will, you will come to know that the word entered, spread, and reigned are all attached to one another. They're all aorist, active, indicatives, third person, singular. Aorist, active, indicatives, every one of them. And it's all about this process of how, 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 did, it, how did I become in Adam dead? He said, well, Adam transgressed the law. He had a law. There was a law. There, in fact, there were two. One law said you can eat of all the trees in the garden. The next law said except one, not the tree of knowledge. You cannot eat from it. In the day you eat from it, you'll die a double death. Smooth, smooth. So here's what, the, here's what Paul did. He used a technical Greek word to put you in a legal agreement under a law of a legal agreement. They carried a, 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 a penal charge, consequence. Agreed? Dying, you will die. I mean, how serious is that? Then what he does, he puts the word entered, spread, right, and reigned all in aorist active indicatives. Aorist is a point in time, divorce from time, that's very important to the time you're in, connected to a time and event previously made. That's the aorist tense. It's a crazy tense. I mean, there's nothing like it in English. The aorist tense is nuts to the English thinking mind. It entered, it spread, right, and reigned from Adam to Moses. It's just, it's just interesting to me the way he lays that out. How he laid that out is just interesting to me. Point number two. We call that in theology, what he said in verse 12, we call that in theology the imputation of Adam's sin. The word entered, spread, and reigned. And the only way out from under that umbrella is Christ dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead, third day called the gospel. Only way. Now here's the second thing that Paul, in my opinion, would like to have us know. As a result of Adam's original sin, AOS, on your paper, two federal heads of the human race were established in theology. Two federal heads of the human race. He does it in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, where I want you to turn in your Bibles. I want you to do an exercise. I want you to get, a, I want you to get your pencil. I want you to open your Bible, and I want you to do a little exercise with me. In the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning with verse 45, Paul writes, 
So it is written. And, he, and now he's going to quote Genesis 2.7. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. They were both created perfect in different ways. Please tell me you know that. And there, was, there were two positive things attached to him. When God made Adam, notice how, how, how it states it in verse 45, how it states it. The first man, Adam, God created, became to become a living soul. That's perfect. That's before the sin. That's when he gave the command to him. And the penal consequence is going to affect that. In the living soul's relationship with God. Example. In, in the story of Genesis 2 and 3, you're, you're very familiar with Adam and Eve and their sin, how it came about with the serpent tempting them and all that. Before they ate of the tree and fell under the penal judgment, they had a wonderful relationship with God in the garden. They had a wonderful relationship like a father and a son, a natural father and a son relationship. That's why he's called the first Adam. The same kind of a relationship he had over here when he did the virgin birth business over here on creation, the wonderful father-son relationship the last Adam had with God. You understand? Before sin. Both of them before sin. And how sin on both hands affected their relationship with him. Do you understand that? I hope you know how good this is. This is gourmet eating. This is why I want to go to a place where more people can hear this. People who really have a desire to hear it. Now watch what he's going to do. That's 45. He does a contrast between the first Adam and the last Adam. I put, the, I put on your paper first Adam. I put a circle. Under the first Adam, write the word unsaved. On the second cir circle, write the word saved. Now what he's going to do, he's going to contrast. You're either in this federal head or this federal head. If you're an unsaver, this is your lot. If you're saved, this is your lot. Are you agreed? Do you understand that? Well, I'm just telling you, okay? I want your eyes. I want your, look, I believe learning involves three things. I believe it involves eye contact, mind contact, and hand contact with something. I think when you do all three of those things, you learn faster and better and quicker. I don't know the difference between faster and quicker, but they're, pretty, they're both pretty quick, aren't they? All right. Here, and so I want you to write. When you hear one, I want you to write it on one side or the other. He's going to contrast, right? So here's what he does. See, we got the one. One, one is a living soul and the other is a life-giving spirit, right? <laughs> I just say, why should I do that, Ron? I just told you. It's already in my Bible. I know where it is. I know. Why did I tell you you should write it? Because it's a way, it's a quicker, faster way of learning. Gosh, you forgot, you forgot kindergarten, didn't you? <laughs> Everybody needs to have a kindergartner in their life. I've got one right now. She came home from school the other day. 
and they taught her how to use coloring. And so when she got home, she thought she would do it on herself. And so she took the markers and dressed herself all up with ideas. Welcome to kindergarten. Now, as a grandparent, I love that. My sister or my daughter is going crazy because what can take that off so she can go to school and learn something tomorrow and come home and do it? <laughs> so there, you have two up there. You have two things. Now here's the next one. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. What side does that go on? Uh, under the first Adam. Then spiritual goes under the other Adam, right? Watch what he's doing. I just want you to watch what he's doing. The first Adam is formed from the earth. Where should you put that? Well, okay, you put it under the first Adam. Earthy, earthy, right? You put earth, earthy. And under the second one, the second man is from heaven. As is the earthly, so is the earthly. As of the heavenly, so is the heavenly. So you got one from earth, you got one from heaven, you got one earthly, and you one earthy and one heavenly, right? Here in verse 49, he gives you the final one. This is the final one. Just as also, just as we have borne the image of the earthly, earthy. Image, image of earthly, we shall also, just as also, bear the image of the heavenly. You got all that? I know you think you know it. What you going to do when somebody that doesn't know it needs to have it explained to them and you don't have your Bible? And you don't have your Bible. And you're going to depend on your memory. If you're depending on your memory, it needs three exercises to have it put in there. Besides the Holy Spirit. <laughs> well, it's your life. And you have a right to live it any way you want. You, it's your life, and you have a right to do it. Now, what I want you to do is between the first Adam and the last Adam on the top of your paper, at, at, at your, and on your paper under point two, please write this down. Write positional truth. And draw a line over to Adam and draw a line over to the first Adam and the second Adam because both of those are positional truths. They're both positional truths. And that's the key doctrine. It has nothing to do with how you behaved. It has to do with who you are. Are you a human being? Most of the time. Okay, I'll take that. I didn't ask you if you're civil. <laughs> I just asked if you're a human being. I don't want to ask too much of you. Both of these are positional truths. That's the two federal heads, that's who you are. That's just the way it is. Here's the point number three. All members of the human race are in one, of, one, one or the other of these two circles. Every member of the human race is in one of these two circles. You're in the unsaved, you, positional truth, or you're in Christ, positional truth. In 1 Corinthians 15, 21, 22, I came back to this. I came back to your circles. <laughs> came back to your circles. In this first circle under the first Adam, or just now Adam, we can drop the first and second, or last. I want you to write in that circle, all die. All die. He said all die. He didn't say some. He said all die. In Adam, in Adam, positional truth, in Adam, all die. He's talking about spiritual. All die. Nobody escapes Adam's circle. 
because that circle is penal. You understand that? It carries a death sentence. Over on Christ's side, in verse 22, all are made alive. That's positional. All are made alive. When you believe the gospel, and that's what's in between them, when you believe that Jesus died for your sins, were buried and raised from the dead the third day, you are going to be moved from a position in Adam, Colossians 1.13, you're going to be rescued from your position in Adam, the domain of darkness, and transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son, all are made alive. All are dead over here. All are made alive over here. The transfer is by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. If you think you're going to get saved by anything other than this, you're mistaken. You're mistaken. Colossians 1.13 is your text. Giving his son an offering for sin, God giving his son, only son, as an offering for sin, Adam's sin, was the greatest gift of love to the world. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. The greatest story of love ever told, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his own love towards us. And while that we were yet sinners, Adam sin, Christ died for us. That's the greatest love story ever told. If you put... A hundred love stories together, they would pale in comparison to this one. God demonstrated his love for you. Demonstrated his love. That's a pretty powerful idea, isn't it? He demonstrated it. You know, if somebody can't get it, you go like, I can't. How does this thing work? Now, you can do one of two things. You can call Ernie. That's what I do. Now, call Ernie. And when Ernie fixes it, I say to him, Ernie, how did, how did, you, do, how did you just do that? You know what he does? He demonstrates. And you know what I do? If I, if I want to learn, I pay attention to the demonstration. Right? And if I don't care, I just want to be lazy and call him back, and he don't mind. He hands you a bill on the way out. He don't mind. But let me tell you, if you want to fix it the next time yourself, you want to demonstrate, you want somebody who knows how to do it to do it right, demonstrate it so the next time you could do it, you could do it right. Agreed? Agreed. I mean, who doesn't do that? That's just good old common sense. That's just old farm boy stuff for me. That's just common sense. When I went to high school, they gave us a lock, all right? Just in case you didn't want something stole, they gave you a lock, combination lock. I like, I, I was a sophomore before I ever could get that thing to work. You turn it here and you turn it there and you turn it back, and then it doesn't go. Then you turn it here and you turn it there and you turn it back and it don't go. You know what you finally do with that? With that? You throw it away and put a sign up there, I will hunt you down and do serious harm to you if you get in my locker. <laughs> Shelby High School. 
<laughs> I never could get a stupid thing to work. I'd take it home and play with it. I'd lock it and couldn't get it unlocked. And I'd go like, oh, jeez. You know, you got to have more patience than I had. That's what I discovered. So a friend of mine, you know, I was just taking that thing. He went, you got to be patient. When you come over here, you got to go right there. Be real quick. You can go fast if you want to over here, but then you got to slow down and get it there. Then you got to come back and get it there. And I went, and it opened. I went, oh, well, <laughs> I guess I learned something today. I'm a very impatient person. And so I was, or, or I guess I'm, I'm still working on it. Here's my final point. It's a long one. I'm going to go and leave the rest of it with you in just a moment. Oh, I want to deal with this. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, he could not die physically or spiritually. Until he became the sin of the world. And then he's going to die both. Do you understand that? This is the son of God. He was created perfect. Adam, when he was created perfect, was not going to die. Physically nor spiritually. Unless he ate of the tree. And that very day, he would die a double death. The first Adam. The last Adam had the same deal. When he hung on that cross, dear people, when he hung on that cross, God put the sins of the entire world upon him. And he was separated from God spiritually. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His heart knew why. And he hollered out, it is finished. And when it was finished, he was restored. And he died physically. And in the spirit, he went to Sheol and spent three days. God, the Holy Spirit, raised him from the dead. That spirit of God that lives in your life is the source of life and power. Romans 8, 11. Did you know that, people? How come, how come sin doesn't tear our guts out when we know what it costs God and what it costs Jesus Christ? How can we be so cavalier with our personal sin? It ought to be the worst day of our life. When we look at the cost to be forgiven. The cost to be forgiven. And you say, well, all I have to do is confess my sin. Yes, but look what it took for you just to confess your sin. My, my, people, my, my. The imputation of Adam's original sin upon the human race was imputed upon Christ while he was still alive on the cross. The imputation of Adam's sin is the basis of spiritual combination of the human race, not personal sin. You don't confess your sin to be saved. You confess it because you are saved. We've gotten so crazy in the church, we forgot what Christ did on the cross and why he did it. The wonderful thing is the death of Christ on the cross covers all sin, both Adamic and personal. And you should be thankful for that, for what he did in 1 John 1, 7 in purifying our life from sin, 
which comes at the moment to the unbeliever when he believes it, for us comes when we confess it, when we confess our personal sin. That should bother your soul. It should bother your soul when you have to confess your sin. What is wrong with me, Ron? What is wrong with me that I can't get this under control in my life? Where is the... Listen, every sin you commit is because you've chose to do it out of the desires of your flesh, the sin nature. That should stop. You can stop that dead end's trap by walking in the power of the Spirit instead of the flesh. You need to live in, in victory and not in victimization. Well, I want you to pay attention to those little dots I've got down below. The first Adam did one thing that condemned the entire human race. The last Adam did one thing that saved the human race from the total condemnation. Think about that. The last Adam. The last Adam's Death for sin rescued every person who believes the gospel from the 13 judicial charges of Adam's original sin, which is called the penalty of Adam's original sin. In 1 John 1, 7, it is the blood of Christ that cleanses the unbeliever. In 1 John 1, 9, it is the blood of Christ that cleanses the believer from personal sin. And there's a stark difference in those two ideas.